the Nigerian Economic Sustainability Plan. The first question I want to, um, first thing I want to say, sir, is that it's um, a great document in theory, but how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for all the wonderful, lofty ideas within those pages of this document? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. First, let me say how uh, extremely grateful I am to Africa Report and to Patrick and yourself, Donu, for uh, kindly putting this together and giving us an opportunity to uh, hold a conversation around our economic uh, sustainability plan. It really is an honor to join so many uh, friends and colleagues and uh, Nigerians and uh, partners and non-Nigerians everywhere for this webinar. So thank you very much. Now, uh, just to your question as to how we intend to fund uh, the sustainability plan, uh, the, the, the plan uh, will cost 2.3 trillion naira, which is about uh, something order of about 6 billion naira or so. Uh, 6 billion dollars, beg your pardon, or so. Now, the plan is um, already, you know, that, that, that this, this, this is uh, on stream. 500 billion naira is budgetary sources, and this is derived by drawing down on special accounts dedicated to supporting sec uh, certain sectors. So that is already in the budget, $500 billion. Now the, 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 the rest of it, about 1.3 trillion, will be from, uh, st very, the, from structured uh, loans given through the CBN for the special projects that we have. So, for example, the CBN will be giving uh, uh, facilities to, for, uh, to farmers under um, our um, Jobs for Agriculture program, which is our mass agriculture program. In the same way, it will be giving structured loans to our mass housing program, as well as to our 5 million solar connections program. So, essentially what we're doing is getting loans through the CBN to pay for the, uh, through the CBN to the commercial banks, to pay specifically for the mass housing program, uh, the uh, mass agriculture program, as well as the solar connections program. And then there are several other initiatives which I hope we'll be able to talk about, especially initiatives with small business and, and all of that. But that's the structure of the uh, of, our, of, uh, of our financing of the scheme. As you well know, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a program that was put together in response to the pandemic. So this is almost entirely out of budget. We have to do a revised um, uh, budget to be able to accommodate these, uh, the, the, these expenditures. And uh, revenues have dropped, <laughs> I mean, as you know, from the pandemic, almost 60%. So basically, you know, there isn't much uh, room, there isn't much uh, fiscal <laughs> buffer for us. So we've got to be, we've had to be, to be as creative as possible, which is why we had to go uh, the route of getting uh, the central bank to give loans uh, for, for these various programs, which is the main source of funding. And then, of course, uh, I mustn't forget to say that, uh, yes, we did get also uh, we did get uh, 3.4 billion US dollars emergency financial assistance from the IMF rapid financing instrument, which you know is is all part of uh, the, the the package as well. The IMF you know gave several developing countries uh, this emergency financial assistance in response to COVID-19, and we got our own uh, bit of that, which is the 3.4 billion uh, US dollars. But that is not all going into uh, the sustainability plan. It's going into several other. Part of it is budget support. Part of it is uh, we will uh, we will apply to the sustainability plan. Thank you. Okay, sir. Well, when exactly did um, this program? Uh, when was it launched exactly? Uh, it was actually launched in May, uh, May 2020. Yes, formally. And so, is, is everything on track on the financing front? Because, you know... Um, well, I, I think that as, as far as that is possible, again, uh, don't forget that 
uh, a substantial part of it is, is by way of loans from, from the CBN. Really, I think more uh, the implementation aspects of it, we're trying to get everything going. The financing is not the immediate problem. As I tried to explain, most of it is coming uh, by way of loans, and we already have 500 billion. So it's more the nitty gritty of, of ensuring that um, the loans get to uh, those uh, for whom it is meant. For example, our mass agriculture scheme, we intend to ensure that the, that the individual farmers who we've now mapped, we have about 5 million new farmers, we're bringing between 20,000 and 100,000 hectares of new farmland under cultivation. And we have about 5 million uh, farmers at this time who have been uh, geo-mapped to their land. So, so, so we have uh, that number, about uh, close to 2 million of them have now been formally cleared to be able to benefit from the facilities. Now the logistics and all of that, making sure that uh, the, and maybe we'll have a time to talk in a bit more detail about those projects. But it is more the, uh, the fine points of getting uh, the funding to those who should have it, getting the inputs in the case of farmers, you know, ensuring that uh, fertilizers get to them, ensuring that improved seedlings get to them, etc. Those, I think, are the more important challenges now. Okay, well, sir, could you please give us an example? As you know, farming is uh, is involved activity. I mean, we, we, are, we are at this time, you know, uh, in the we're, we are getting all of our farmers together. Just as I've explained, we have... Uh, about 5 million farmers in all who are part of our scheme. And the way that this is being done is that we, the, 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 the program itself uh, tries to address all of the value chain issues from farm to table. For instance, we're linking small scale farmers, you know, up with aggregators or platform partners who will ensure that they have access to finance. So for example, we have uh, Bobangona, who is a major, they are, uh, what we call platform farmers or aggregators. That's a major farm, a, a major agricultural company. Now, what happens is that we'll, uh, Babangana has a couple of thousand, just as an example, 30,000 farmers who work with, uh, with that company. Now, they are aggregators. They also ensure that each of the farmers has access to finance. Of course, this finance is coming, as you know, through the central bank by way of the facility I just described. They give them agricultural extension services and inputs, seeds and fertilizers, so that each of these farmers is more or less supervised by a platform partner or an aggregator, such as the Bangor, a major uh, farm. Now, what happens then is that when uh, the output comes, when the harvest comes, Babangona takes all of the uh, uh, takes all of that. So there's a guaranteed offtake. Whatever they cannot take, the government takes. Government takes that for its strategic grain reserves or even for our homegrown school feeding program. So one of the key factors of the of this mass agricultural program is that there is guaranteed offtake for the farmers. So the, because what we're trying to achieve is both creation of jobs, millions of jobs for the farmers. We're also trying to you know, guarantee food security by trying to produce food. But if you can't guarantee offtake for the farmers, then it, you know, uh, all of this might be lost. So we're also trying to guarantee uh, offtake for the farmers, which is what we're, you know, so it, it's difficult to say at this point because the program has just started. So we are, you know, uh, in the various, uh, the, the different parts of the country. As I said, in each, uh, what we're trying to bring into cultivation is almost uh, tw between 20,000 and 100,000 hectares of new farmland in each state. Every state that's able to give us hectare, we're, we're happy to take it. Uh, for example, Plateau State has given us about 125,000 hectares. This is for the uh, NLTP component of the program. So. We're, we're, we're making progress. Okay. Well, export revenues are falling. Um, do we have high hopes in terms of agricultural exports? 
Do we have high hopes? Or are we looking at domestic consumption? You mean of the agricultural exports? Well, we yes. have, we do have, we do have. Well, well, you see, first, we're hoping that um, we that just satisfying the local market, and that's huge. I mean, the, the local market itself is huge. So we're hoping that we can become net exporters. You know, uh, we are the biggest. Uh, we are the biggest producers of yam, of cassava, in the, you know, practically in the world. And we will become the biggest uh, rice producers uh, in Africa, at least. So we will, uh, in, in my view, through this scheme, become net exporters of, of, of several of these, um, of several of the uh, produce that we are, that at the moment we are growing. I, I, I think there's very uh, great opportunity for that. Uh, and then, you know, uh, there are also other soybeans, for instance, you know, we think we can do that, vegetables, agriculture. But you see, the interesting thing, uh, what, I've, what, what I've found in this past few years, is that the local market itself is so huge that uh, even satisfying the local market for food is, is a major enterprise all, all, all by itself. So we expect that, you know, yes, there will be uh, significant um, we, we will have uh, significant export opportunities, you know, as we as we go along. Okay, let me just briefly touch on housing, the housing stimulus plan, yeah. which talks about engaging young professionals and artisans, yeah. um, so that they form themselves into small and medium enterprises within the construction industry, and you know, this highlights the use of indigenous labor and materials. There's also talk of, you know, using indigenous materials. This sounds great. Um, how will this stop young Nigerians from queuing up at the Canadian Embassy? Well, let, let me say that um, there are two different issues. Um, one is that, um, as you know, people will always look for, I mean, talent will seek the best rewards. And that's, that's, that's something you may not be able to... Uh, you may not be able to do much about unless you create those opportunities uh, for the best rewards for talent. But uh, just to the point about the housing program, we have a target of 300,000 housing units uh, for this plan. A huge, uh, it is a huge, um, it is a huge target. But when you break it down, it means that each state will build something in the order of about 8,300 or so housing units in each of the 36 states. And that will come to, you know, maybe about just under 400 houses in each local government. Now, the whole idea, the whole idea is to engage uh, young, uh, young men and women who are builders, architects and all that, forming small companies that can take uh, these housing units in, in lots, right? So, for example, you know, a, a group of, uh, a, a small company of builders will take 10 houses, build 10 houses in a state, build 20 houses and all of that. And what we expect to happen and what we have planned is that in each site, you would have block making going on there, you would have uh, door uh, manufacturing, you would have uh, the window manufacturing and all of that. In, in other words, we're trying to ensure that it is local, uh, local materials that are used, local labor, local materials, and all of that. So that the engineers, builders, designers have something to do, the carpenters, artisans, etc., also have something to do in each of these sites. We're hoping that each of okay. these... Right. Okay. Okay. Sorry, sir. I, I, I mustn't monopolize you. It's, yeah. it's Patrick's turn to ask you a few okay. questions. All right. Thank you, Donna. Um, Vice President, um, your bouncing back uh, economic sustainability plan mm -hmm. talks about helping local companies, particularly shielding them from the sort of pressures we've seen around the world in terms of credits, in terms of markets, and the whole production process. But at the same time, uh, reorienting the, com the country right. to boost local capacity, local production. Um, I'm wondering, uh, since this plan was launched in May, what has been the, the outcome so far? What, what successes have you seen in this area? 
Mm. And do you have a message to reassure the many local business owners in Nigeria who are listening to this about what, how the government's going to help them? Okay. Uh, let, let me say first that um, just a couple of days ago, we launched uh, what is called the Survival Fund. The Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment launched the Survival Fund. Now, the Survival Fund is payroll support for about 500,000 beneficiaries. And the, 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 the plan is to take uh, qualifying businesses, small businesses, who have, a, who have a minimum of 10 employees and will pay uh, salaries of 10 employees of these small, uh, small, uh, small, small scale companies for three months. So we'll take up their payroll for, for three months, 10 of the employees for three months. Now, we just opened the portal about uh, two, three days ago, and that, there's been massive response to, to that. So payroll support is one very important way that we intend to support uh, small-scale industry. We're also giving artisans and transporters uh, grants of, uh, uh, of about uh, 100,000 naira per artisan or per transporter. And that will cover about 300, 333,000 uh, such artisans and transporters. Uh, there's also uh, uh, a free business name registration that we're doing for 250,000 uh, persons who wish to register their businesses. In total, we're looking at about 1.3 million uh, beneficiaries under the Survival Fund and under the uh, MSME grants to uh, the, the artisans and transporters grants. Then we also have a guaranteed offtake scheme. The guaranteed offtake scheme basically is uh, government says if you manufacture uh, face masks, if you manufacture sanitizers, and certain types of food, uh, certain types of uh, food products, we will, uh, we will buy from you, we will take that food off you. There's guaranteed offtake, and this is for about 300,000 of such uh, producers of food. Both schemes altogether will benefit about 1.7 million uh, small businesses and, and individuals. Now, it is, and when you look at it in terms of the overall numbers, you know, we're, 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 we know that this isn't, this isn't going to, it's not going to dramatically, uh, it's not going to make a, a dramatic change. But what we, are, what we are hoping to do is that in aggregate, we look at what we're trying to do in uh, making solar connections, in housing, in uh, agriculture and all that, the support we're giving. And then we're also, the, the, the central bank is also supporting, uh, we're, we're hoping to be able to get support for aviation, support for uh, hospitality, the hospitality industry. I mean, these are industries that have suffered tremendously. Uh, hospitality, for example, some of the biggest hotels I've had, you know, under 10% occupancy, in the, in, in, especially in the past four or five months. So we want to uh, give them some support, but we're also restructuring their loans. We're granting uh, moratoriums of their loans for a year, so they may not have to pay. In fact, that's, if, if you have um, a loan, for instance, from the Bank of Industry, or, you know, a direct intervention of the CBN, you, you already have a one-year moratorium. And we're trying to get the same moratorium for many businesses who have commercial loans so that they can, you know, go off for one year without having to pay, uh, to, to, to pay any, any loans, just to ease uh, their, their, their cash flows and all that. So these are, you know, some of what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Vice President. I, I wanted to ask about the revenue situation, because you, you said uh, to us, how you're planning to finance the bounce back program itself but then there's the the matter of just running the the country as well using the budgetary revenue to to finance the health education uh, social investment and infrastructure and so on um now it was the target of your government to get up to non-oil revenue i think up to 15 percent of the country's gross domestic product yeah. um and since uh, your party came to power in 2015, they've made incremental progress on that. Yeah. But I think the last available figures were for 2018, and it's up was around 8.7 percent. 
I guess what a lot of people are concerned about right now is to what extent um, the government is not going to reach those revenue targets. Mm. Um, and what, what's the fallback plan? If, uh, if the non-oil revenue falls short, and looking at the oil market at the, at the moment, although it's improved from earlier in the year, it's still pretty, uh, pretty fragile. Um, what's, what's the plan on, on revenues, please? Mm. Okay, thank you. I, they, they, first, let me say that um, all our plans for revenue, of course, have been uh, hit very badly. By, uh, the, by, by the pandemic and the, uh, and the fallouts of the pandemic. So there's no question at all that we are way behind in terms of revenue targets. Uh, we've seen a drop of almost six, just slightly over 60% of revenues. So it's a major hit. There's no question at all that we're, you know, it's very difficult to meet revenue objectives. And, you know, uh, despite the fact also that oil prices uh, at least have sort of stabilized somewhat, you know. But the problem we have is with uh, fairly low production and very low uptake, uh, of, uh, uptake of, 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 of oil, of cargo. And the simple reason why that is the case is because many of the world's economies are not opening up yet. I mean, we, for instance, you know, one of, our, uh, the major, one, one of the major uh, consumers of our oil, one of our major... Um, customers for oil is India. Uh, India, as you know, uh, has uh, it's grappling with uh, with the pandemic. Its its factories are opening up quite slowly, so we naturally have a problem even with offtake of our oil. So revenues are really low, and um, we 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 have ramped up. You know, our tax to GDP was somewhere around. 6%, we ramped that up to about 8%, 8% as of last year, you know, but uh, with what we're, what we're seeing now, obviously, it's even more difficult for people to pay taxes than ever before, I mean, given the state of affairs. But um, this is why we're doing everything that, we, uh, that, 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 um, we've, well, that we're doing, uh, namely trying to ensure that businesses survive this period by providing as much support as we can, uh, by relieving them of as much, uh, uh, you know, by, by relieving them of, of as much burden as possible, especially by way of their loans, uh, ensuring that they're able to get some, uh, so, you know, they're able to get some, uh, some uh, moratorium and some allowance for, so that they can at least continue to run their businesses and by all the other interventions and support that we're giving. We hope that those interventions will help businesses. Our, our approach is first to ensure that we save jobs. If we save jobs, if we save businesses, if that works, and, and then we do the best we can in agriculture, uh, do the best we can through the housing schemes and all of that, we will actually be able to improve spending. And if we're able to improve spending, if we're able to improve money in the hands of people, taxes will definitely improve. If businesses survive, taxes will improve. So those are the sort of projections that we have. But there's no question at all that uh, in terms of our finances, we're going through the possibly the most difficult period in, 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 in our recent history. So, so Vice President, um, can Nigerian businesses and uh, particularly the wealthy individuals expect at some point to pay higher taxes or is the government on the other side of the argument that putting up taxes now would actually be counterproductive because it would slow the country's recovery from the pandemic-induced recession? Yeah, um, our position really is that this is hardly the time to raise taxes. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, our, the, the way that we've looked at it is that um, as much as possible, uh, we should be looking at how to reduce the burden you know, rather than increase the burden. We think that um, companies that are already within the net who are paying their taxes, you know, uh, uh, should just be left alone to, uh, to figure, to, 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 to prosper. And uh, as things improve, uh, I'm sure that their own, uh, their, our own financial flows will improve. But we're certainly not looking at increasing taxes at all. As a matter of fact, uh, 
all of what we're looking at now is how to ensure that the environment um, you know makes sense for uh, badly hit uh, supply chains uh, badly hit uh, businesses you know as I've said several businesses have huge uh, problems just trying to stay alive you know so a tax increase just wouldn't make sense at this point um Vice President, I also I wanted to follow up then on this issue of public finance yes. with the question about the recent uh, cut to the subsidy on fuel in Nigeria and the move to a more market-driven tariff for electricity provision. Um, are those moves um, out of financial necessity, or does that does it mark a shift in government thinking? towards um, using more tools of market economics uh, to run the economy and, and trying to make fuel distribution and electricity provision more commercially viable and more successful. Okay, um, thank you. Let, let me say first that um, we, we've had, uh, as, you, as I said, uh, a severe downturn in our finances. So at 60% less revenue, we are in a position where sustaining fuel subsidies is practically impossible, simply because we do not have the resources. That's the first thing. Now, the, and so as of March 18th, uh, 2020, was when we effectively deregulated, you know, uh, we when oil prices at that point time were very low, and um, pump price was at about 125 naira. Yeah, and, and, and just to explain what these subsidies cost, you know, in, in 2018, we paid 722 billion in, in subsidies. And in 2019, we paid 546 billion in subsidies. Today, our entire budgetary package for the economic sustainability plan. In other words, cash that we, are, where we can make available in budget is 500 billion. So that, you know, so, so that tells you what the difficulties are. You know? So we want to do a sustainability plan to be able to ensure that businesses survive, to be able to ensure that we're able to continue to provide services, pay salaries, etc. All we have is 500 billion for the budget, that's what I'm saying, for the economic sustainability plan. But in 2018, in 2019, we paid 546 billion in subsidies. Previously, 722 billion. Now, with 60% less revenue, we just don't have the money. That's, that's, that's the honest truth. We simply don't have the money. So now, I'm, 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 so the, and the reason why I say that's the honest truth is because I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that it is both for us a, a, an absolute necessity and at the same time, you know, uh, an, an, an economic, uh, an, an, an economic, um, uh, an economic um, approach to solving, to solving a problem. So what, we're, what, so what are we doing? We've decided then that, look, we've got to focus on CNG, on compressed nat natural, uh, natural gas. CNG is about half the price of petrol today. So if, if we use CNG to, uh, for our cars and for our buses, uh, it will cost about between 78 and 80 naira or so per liter, you know, uh, for CNG. And we're thinking that if we convert cars, of course, government will uh, bear the cost of the conversion of cars and buses so that they can use both um, CNG and uh, PMS and petrol we'll be able to bring down the cost so that the average person, transporter, individual who owns a car, will be able to get, uh, uh, power, uh, will be able to get energy, will be able to get, uh, uh, will be able to power their cars and all of that at half, at about half the cost that they are paying currently today. Now, just to give an example, Dangote, who has a large fleet of, uh, of trucks, has already converted to CNG. That's almost 5,000 trucks. So he's able to use PMS and CNG. We already have an experiment going on in Edo State also about converting cars and all of that. The whole of India use uh, 
CNG. India doesn't even have uh, uh, petrol or gas, but they use, uh, uh, they, they import gas and use CNG. So we think that this is the way to go for us. We think that uh, expensive petrol uh, subsidies cannot even be sustained because we simply don't have the resources to do so. So that's uh, part of uh, the strategy that we're, uh, that, that we're adopting. Now, in the case of uh, electricity, what we're trying to, to do is to ensure that we're able to, I mean, as you know, the electricity industry is privatized, except for uh, transmission, you know. But what we've seen is that the discos, these are the distribution companies, are just not able to uh, meet their targets or to even provide uh, electricity on any kind of stable basis. Now, we have, uh, at various times, we, 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 at this point we have at least close to 11,000 uh, uh, megahertz of power, you know, installed capacity of something close to 13,000 megahertz of power. But we're able to, uh, to, to dispatch about 4,000. We have the capacity to do about 5,000, but even part of that is rejected. Why? The discos will say, well, we can't sell, we, we can't sell this, but you know, there's no, and in many cases, and this, and this is the fault of, 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 of many of them, there's no metering. So, you know, naturally, uh, people resist the estimated billings and all of that. So what we've tried to do is to say, look, and they've been hankering all these years for uh, estimated, uh, for uh, cost-reflective tariffs, we don't, where, 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 you know, government has been paying, again, the subsidy. In fact, uh, so far, in the past two years, we've spent about 1.3 trillion on subsidies uh, for, 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 for electricity. Again, here's a situation where that's completely unaffordable. But what we decided to do is to say, look, if you, if you're, if you use, if, if the disco is able to supply 12 hours or more of of, um, of power, then you would uh, pay the new, you, you, you would pay the cost reflective tariff. So it's based entirely on service. But we're saying that the vast majority of, of our people, people who are underserved, who uh, use less than 12 hours of power, will not experience any tariff increases or any tariff, uh, I, uh, or any cost reflective tariff at all which is the vast majority of, of our people anyway, about 75%. But we are hoping that this will lead to a situation where we're compelling the, the, the discourse to, uh, to, to improve uh, supply, to ensure that they actually make, uh, uh, to, to, to actually provide more than 12 hours of, of power. In many cases, we're saying that you cannot improve, you cannot hike unless you are providing, you know, between 12 and 24 hours of power. Now, part of the uh, problems we've experienced is that the discos have not provided the, the, the investment for metering, right? And so the president ordered that there must be mass metering before, uh, that there will be no estimated billing, except if uh, what, what we have now is a capping. In other words, you cannot pay anything beyond what your neighbors are paying if you don't have, uh, if you don't have a, a meter. So we're rolling out about uh, 5 million new meters now, and uh, we're hoping that you know, uh, the vast majority of, uh, of, of, of customers of uh, the discos will have meters. But more importantly, we want to ensure that new, uh, new discos, new companies come into the market so that we decentralize completely the, 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 the power sector. So that new companies can come and you know uh, sell power, produce power, and sell power, and nobody can maintain an absolute monopoly, because we think that if we decentralize in this way, several parts of our country can you know can have their micro grids and small grids and all of that, and more power can come into and more power can come uh, into the equation. Today we have a national grid that's able to do about 5,000 uh, uh, megahertz of power. But if we have several different microgrids across the country, and uh, our solar effort as well, because we're, we're, we're doing 5 million solar connections as part of the economic sustainability plan, we think that we can 
electrify our country within a short period of time. But we must break the monopolies that we have at the moment. We must break the monopolies. If we don't break those monopolies and enable other players to come into the market, take territory and, and produce power and supply power, then, we'll, then, then we won't be able to solve our problems. So these are you know, some of the issues uh, around, uh, the, uh, around uh, PMS and uh, the electricity, uh, uh, electricity market. Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for giving me this opportunity to uh, give you a very quick brief about uh, Channel Vast. So I, I'm actually in Nigeria, and I, I was born in Nigeria and grew up there all my life. And uh, I'm proud to say I started Channel Vast in Nigeria, and it's become the largest fintech uh, company uh, in the world and the most profitable one. Uh, we are in 40 countries today, so we're a great example for many other companies that could actually start in Nigeria. We started kind of in the good days, well before the pandemic and the uh, uh, drop in oil prices and so on. But um, one of the, the, the big concern I have, and we have now international investors on our board, and we want to invest more money in uh, Nigeria. The biggest concern the investors have today is how do we take our money out? The system... Uh, simply does not provide us with foreign currency anymore. Foreign currency is being preserved for key raw materials. A lot of other materials have been banned from importation, knowing Nigeria is an import uh, country, um, even though it's on its trajectory to hopefully become self-independent. Uh, uh, the, the key issue still remains. How is the problem of foreign exchange going to be addressed once and for all and how does the government plan to merge the dual exchange rate, meaning the parallel market and the official rate, so that investors can have that certainty? Meaning, are you going to bo borrow more money to pump more dollars in the market? Or, or how is this going to be addressed? Because this is a key and fundamental problem for future investments. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Basim. I think that first, um, as you know, uh, this is a central bank function. So uh, I would have to uh, talk about it just in, in broad terms because uh, there are fiscal and uh, monetary uh, type conversations. And I, I, I would not, of course, be able to say that the central bank must do X and Y. We have an autonomous uh, central bank. But let me say that um, first we're all very concerned about, um, the, uh, about the challenges that um, investors have, not just the you know, foreign direct investments such as yourself, but also portfolio investors who uh, have difficulty taking out their, uh, who have had some difficulty taking out their money. We experience the same problems uh, during the recession in 2016, 2017, but we were able to get out of it, you know, and we're able to resolve most of the issues. Uh, around that in that period. And we think that we will, uh, by and large, resolve these issues also. Uh, we are, at, uh, our conversations with the central bank uh, are generally to the effect that we're looking at all the possible options for ensuring greater uh, liquidity in the foreign exchange market, especially the I and E window. We're looking at all the possible options. And there is nothing uh, that is off the table in terms of ensuring that we show up our reserves and that we have uh, adequate uh, uh, and that we have adequate uh, foreign exchange to ensure uh, that, that, that the market runs. We, uh, I think the general agreement is that we must move more towards market in, in our foreign exchange uh, in, 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 in our foreign exchange sector. And, uh, and this also means that the merger, this also means that the merger of uh, the exchange rates, uh, the dual exchange rate, is without a doubt something on the that, that that's something on the cards. The central bank has chosen to take a gradualist approach to to that merger, but we expect that um, you know we expect that that will be ramped up uh, quite quickly. We all have concerns, especially those of us on the, the fiscal side. We have concerns about uh, ensuring that there is more, that the, the foreign exchange market is more market driven, you know, and that uh, we 
give more room. And we think that if there is, if 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 market is allowed to play more of a role, we think that uh, foreign exchange will come in. We think that uh, there are several investors that are might be waiting on the wings, waiting to see a much more, uh, waiting to see a much more certain and a much more market driven exchange rate. And if they see that. The, the dollars will come in. We, 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 we don't think that um, it's just a matter of acquiring dollars from somewhere. We think that the very logic of markets is that um, if we open it up, uh, dollars will, uh, the dollars will come in. Uh, if you recall, in 2016, 2017, the, once we opened the IRE window and allowed a bit of market, we, we, we found a boost. And this is what we, especially on the fiscal side, think uh, should happen. And we are, you know, we're, we're very hopeful that that will be the uh, that will be the approach that the central bank will take. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Vice President. Um, I'm going to try to push these questions into groups. We've got so many. I, you know, yesterday evening we had over you know 150 questions. Even more have come in since you started speaking today. The first bunch of questions are about, uh, I guess, broadly the economic nationalist question, um, and. Um, Idi uh, Nazufi, who is an educator, uh, asks about the policy of the of Nigeria closing its borders um, as of last August, uh, well before the pandemic. Um, and we have a program a question from uh, Handan Borji of the World Food Program in Addis Ababa, um, again asking how Nigeria's um, approach to border closure fits in with the uh, imperatives of the African continental free trade area. And a very specific question from Dr. Seydou Sacco of ECOWAS, who asks you, when will Nigeria reopen its borders? Um, can you give us a sense of the government's thinking on these questions? Mm. And uh, if possible, a timeline? Well, let, let, let me say first that uh, the, the reason uh, why we uh, closed our borders at the time we did were well, two, two, two main reasons. The first was that um, we were trying to control uh, the uh, avalanche of uh, smuggled light arms and ammunition into the country, which, as you know, is a major security concern for us, uh, especially as we contend with uh, insurgency in the Northeast, uh, some uh, banditry in the northwest, and some of the insecurity problems that we had. So they, they so they, so they, uh, smuggling of light arms and ammunition is one. Secondly, uh, of course, you probably also appreciate that um, we found that uh, producers in priority sectors like rice and poultry were struggling to cope with uh, smuggled products dumped in our market using our land borders as, as entry points. As a matter of fact, uh, some of our neighbors, we, we, were, uh, we, 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 had to, uh, we had to contend with some of our neighbors actually uh, being used as uh, almost uh, staging posts for you know, bringing in uh, rice and uh, poultry and other smuggled products into Nigeria. So what we've done then, uh, in a, in, and we're working with our neighbors to see how uh, and on what terms we will reopen those borders. Uh, we are at the moment uh, undertaking joint border patrols, and, we, and these joint border patrols are at uh, an experimental stage. And this is a positive signal. We expect a lot of progress on this matter. We got all of our neighbors to understand that um, aside from uh, the fact that uh, smuggling, well, arms and ammunition and uh, these products in, is existential for us, economically and security-wise. We, 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 we had to get their buy-in and cooperation to working with us to ensure that uh, we're able to control uh, smuggling along the borders. So we think that uh, these uh, joint patrols are working, and I'm sure that uh, soon enough we, we, we should have uh, the, the borders open. Uh, regarding the question of how this works with uh, the uh, free trade, I think that um, we are committed uh, to the uh, free trade uh, agreements uh, and we are negotiating all of the 
uh, where we're at this point negotiating all of the various aspects uh, that require uh, negotiation. But I want to say that uh, we are also concerned about, you know, I mean, the threats to security and, and, and threats to, to, to the economy. And we have to take certain actions sometimes, which may, uh, w w which of course may not necessarily uh, be uh, in the overall uh, interests of, of everyone, but at least would satisfy uh, the immediate requirements and the immediate needs of our country. We have to have a country uh, that will survive in order to be able to negotiate and deal with other countries uh, in our region. So I think that that's uh, our reason for the border closures, but it certainly isn't meant to be permanent, and we are looking forward to reopening as quickly as possible. Thank you, Vice President. I wanted to ask another question about national finances. Uh, we've got a question from Nimi Princewell of the People's Gazette here in, or there, in Abuja, um, who wants to know why were there no moves in the plan to cut the salaries of Nigeria's lawmakers, whom he says are one of the, some of the highest paid in the world. Um, and secondly, a question from Alex Onyeku, an accountant in Nigeria, who is worried about the inflation rate. We've all talked about fuel and electricity prices. Um, it's currently, he says, about 13%. Are there specific measures in your plan, and more generally, to keep the inflation rate under control? I know you've just uh, cut the interest rates, or the central bank has just cut the interest rates. Could you respond to that, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, first, let me just to address the questions around uh, national finances. Um, the plan, uh, the economic sustainability plan, uh, could not, of course, recommend salary cuts because. Uh, salary cuts, as, as you know, are, are done by recommendations from the Revenue Fiscal and Mobilization Committee. There's a whole process for doing that. And um, so while voluntary salary cuts, as was done by the House of Representatives, may be done uh, in order to do so uh, in any meaningful way and effectively, you have to go through the Revenue uh, Fiscal uh, mobilization uh, commission to, 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 to do so. Now that's on the one hand, uh, but the, the, the other point uh, is that we also strongly believe that um, we, we must uh, ensure that we rationalize government spending uh, in various ways and uh, this is why we've done uh, several uh, different, we've done several uh, different rationalizations in the in the new budget, you probably see that there's quite a few uh, recurrent expenditures that has been cut down. Several, uh, in so many important respects, we've rationalized uh, such that we are, as it were, bare bones in terms of any any uh, expenditure that we think uh, may not be may not be um, may, may not be appropriate at this time. But going to the questions of inflation. Uh, this, what, what we're experiencing in some senses, uh, there are those who will say that this is cost push, cost push uh, inflation because, uh, again, we've seen a rise in uh, the exchange rates, the, uh, the, the value of the Naira and all of that. So considerable number of imported items, of course, have gone up and we import uh, quite a few uh, uh, we we'll put quite a few things, including some food items. And we've also had some, because of the disruptions in the supply chain over the COVID uh, period, we, that has also led to uh, prices going up. So what you found is that in many cases, you know, uh, prices went up, or was the prices, uh, the, the inflation uh, has moved up in the past uh, two, three months. Uh, and that is in the period when these severe disruptions took place. We think that as the supply chains open up, as we ramp up uh, food production, and you know, as we bring uh, back more of, of our businesses and all of that, we think that we might be able to uh, bring down inflation somewhat. But again, you know, as economists will say, you know, 
we, we may have to allow some bit of inflation in order to be able to increase consumer spending, in order to put money in the hands of people. We may have to just tolerate some, uh, some, uh, some inflation. But we're working very hard to ensure that um, we don't wipe out uh, money in people's hands by uh, the, the inflationary trends. And um, we, we, we think that with increased supply of goods and with the disruptions um, uh, corrected, uh, with food production going up, you know, we think that we might be able to, we might be able to do much more and, and improve inflation more.